I once asked Holly, who used to mm-hmm. run Wayno, who was then at Twitter. So I once asked him, like, what's one piece of advice you would give a freelancer who's trying to turn their business from a single sole proprietorship freelancer into a more like a studio or to have people who report to you? How do you build a freelance business beyond yourself? And his answer was very short, but very helpful. Um, it was get repeat clients. Even if the person is not coming back to you for the same company, that human being will come back to you at the next job they're at, next time they need icons. So that was really helpful to me because it basically told me I need to build relationships, not just with companies, but with human beings. Welcome to Deep Dives. My name is Rid, and this is where we go deep with the best designers so that you can learn from their journey and apply it to your own career. Today, I'm talking with Bonnie Kate Wolf, who's one of the most talented icon designers on the planet. She's worked for companies like Stripe, Airbnb, Lyft, and she's even the creator of the Netflix icon library. In today's episode, we discuss BK's principles for iconography, how she sources inspiration, and how she applies a systems mindset to her work. But first, I wanted to learn more about her journey and how she decided that she wanted to specialize in iconography. I started designing icons in, I think it was 2016 or 2017. Um, I was a production designer at Square on the brand team. And they already had some icons that their design director had made. And he was very into icons and pixel art. And I did pixel art as a child, like a literal child, like eight years old. And nobody else wanted to make more of these icons. And so my manager said, hey, you like drawing. And, you know, you're a production designer, so you've got a pretty good eye for detail. Would you be interested in drawing some icons? And I was like, yes. So I started designing icons for Square. And the design director at the time basically would review for hours every single icon I made. We would sit at my computer and Illustrator at the time and look at them and fidget with them. And he would be like, no, that's literally one pixel off. And so it was probably like a dozen hours plus of him giving me feedback on this icon set. And then that turned into, oh, well, I could build product icons and product designers would find that useful. And I started doing that. And that kind of continued as a person who's doing one job, but who's also making icons. So at Open Table, I was a brand designer. I also made icons. At Aura, I was a brand designer who also made icons. And then eventually when I was leaving Open Table, I was supposed to go to Thumbtack March, 2020, my offer was rescinded like many people at the time. And I started freelancing. And it's at that point where I was like, oh, I could be an icon designer. That could be the kind of freelancer I am. And that just kind of snowballed essentially. And that became what I do. It's the thing I liked the best. It's the thing I was the fastest at and there was demand. How did you get those original freelance contracts in 2020? One of them was me reaching out to Meg at Lyft when she was at Lyft at the time, because she said, hey, if anyone's been impacted by COVID layoffs, let me know. We might be looking for somebody to help. So I reached out to Meg. She also lived in San Francisco. And I was like, you're so cool. I like you so much. Can I have coffee with you? And she was very nice. And of course she said yes. And so I met her once and I didn't think that would eventually turn into a job. But then when she posted this, I was like, there you go, there it is. So I responded um, and they ended up giving me that contract. So that was the Lyft job for Airbnb. It was like uh, a friend of mine at Square went to Airbnb. He was an engineer though, and he was working on the experiences team. So when his teammate said, hey, we need icons, who can we hire? My friend said, oh, well, I think BK makes icons because he's an engineer. He's, he does know exactly what I do, but he kind of knows. So I was like, yeah, Henry, I think I make icons. And I sent him the article I wrote for designsystems.com. He gave it to um, Matt Farag, who was working there at the time. And that turned into a project. So a lot of it is like a friend who's adjacent in some way or a person I've reached out to. Like I find my way back into their circle because they need my skill set, and I'm friendly enough. Yeah, I was about to say that it it goes to to show the value of just being a nice person that people want to be around. Yeah. Everyone in your path just keeps pulling you back because they want to work with you again. I think that says a lot about you. I once asked Holly, who used to Mm -hmm. run Wayno, who was then at Twitter. So I once asked him, like, what's one piece of advice you would give a freelancer who's trying to turn their business from a single sole proprietorship freelancer into a 
more like a studio or to have people who report to you, how do you build a freelance business beyond yourself? And his answer was very short, but very helpful. Um, It was get repeat clients. Even if the person is not coming back to you for the same company, that human being will come back to you at the next job they're at, next time they need icons. So that was really helpful to me because it basically told me I need to build relationships, not just with companies, but with human beings. It's amazing. I guess I'm curious, have you went back and looked at that original icon set that you designed for Square? Does it hold up? I literally looked at it today for reasons I'm not allowed to discuss. Not related to Square, related to a completely different thing. And as I was looking at it, I was like, dang, this is actually pretty good. And I think a lot of that is because the design director was looking over my shoulder, making sure like I was nailing it. But I have looked at other old work. Like I've looked at my stuff for Open Table and gone, oh, I see all these opportunities to improve or the stuff I did for Aura. Places where I didn't have mentorship or other illustrators is just me. That work tends to be the stuff where I'm like, oh, now I see where I could have done better. Um, Whereas the projects where I was working in tandem with others tend to be better because there were more eyes on the project. Were there any like themes or specific tactics or skill sets that you would say you really improved in over the years? Consistency is probably the main one. And that really happened once I worked at Lyft because I was working with Marianne Yen, Nick Slater, and Meg Robichaud, as well as a couple other folks at Lyft on the product side. And I thought I was good at designing icons when I started. And then I started working with the three of them and I was like, oh, I'm very average. (laughs) They're so good and so consistent. They see these tiny details that once they tell you what they've seen, you can't unsee it. And so now that's the kind of stuff that I'm looking at. And I, because I have subcontractors as well that work with me, that I'm the person pointing out now. Things like, okay, well, if you're going to have icons at an angle, like a phone or a pen or something like that, they should all be at the same angle, like 45 degrees. And they should all be facing the same way because your slash, you want to be able to all go the same way. If you swap back and forth, then all of a sudden it starts to break things in the system farther down the line. So consistency is the thing I think I've improved in the most and where I still have room to grow. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, obviously you have such a robust portfolio. You've worked on a lot of household names and amazing companies. Do you have a set of icons that you're most proud of? Yes. So I'm definitely the most proud of all the work I've done for Netflix, partially because it's good work that I am proud of, partially because I learned so much doing it. And it was such a big project that I was entrusted with that I really didn't even know how to do. I think when I started it, we figured it out along the way, but it really pushed me to grow. And now I'm getting to do like emojis and stuff like that. And that's the stuff where I'm like, ooh, now we're really getting into really fun stuff. It's these small illustrations with color and expanding icons into emojis has been really fun for me lately. So there's only a couple in the Netflix app right now, but I have made a lot of them for them. (laughs) So who knows when they'll end up in the app or you might see them. I saw those hearts on Twitter and I just kept coming back to the tweet because it looks so good. So good. So That's what we call the pictogram library. So those are built at uh, 96 by 96 and then put into, I'm sure y'all care about pixel sizes, 96 by 96 into a 144 by 144 container so that I can have like glowy ass things in that uh, white space. I can't share a huge amount of it because I'm not sure what's actually published, but I I try to share things that will give nothing away, like a heart. I'm like, that's, it's a heart. Uh, It's not going to tell somebody what a new product feature is, but That project took a long time and to get the style to where it was difficult. um, It started off with an agency doing the work. And when I saw it at the time, the the agency's original like deliverables, I thought, oh my God, they're so beautiful. This looks like pretty good. I see some places where like I could tweak it and maybe improve them a little bit with my knowledge being in-house. But like this agency that worked with them is one of the best agencies working in the States, I would say. And there was some feedback about the work it wasn't perfect. So I took a stab at it and was able to actually solve it. And now we have those hearts and a whole bunch of other drawings that I've made in that style. And that for me was a huge moment where I was able to see that I am as good as the best and sometimes better than the people that I look up to, which is wild because objectively I was able to solve a problem they couldn't solve. And that is extremely cool to me that I have specialized to the level where 
if I weren't me, I would see it and go, I wish I made that. Oh, wait, I did make that. I guess for people like myself who are not skilled iconographers, I just don't even understand the amount of thought that goes into it. Can you talk more about the types of problems that you're even encountering and solving and how iconography fits into this larger system? I would say scaling is one of the biggest issues because a lot of the time I'll see a system and people are just using icons of all sorts of different sizes. And so figuring out how are we going to scale these? What is a solution that is going to be practical is a big problem with scaling. So like the Netflix system has 12 sizes. That's too many sizes. <laughs> Most systems should not have that many. We have that because of TV, having to put things on a television is complicated. So how can you build a system that scales because it's gonna look more cohesive throughout? So figuring out the kind of scalability of the system is really important because then it keeps things on pixel and it keeps things looking crisp and it makes things look consistent. Consistency is, is super important with icons. Another maybe more creative problem that I'm solving a lot of the time is what symbol to use? And we have a Discord channel called What Symbol. It's just like a bunch of different icon designers and we talk about what symbol we should use for a certain thing. Oh, that's um, cool. It's very cool because you're like, oh, I don't know for this weird thing. Like, like I had to come up with an icon for Netflix for profile transfer. I know I can talk about it because I saw it in my Netflix account. It's live. And that's literally taking your profile and moving it to your own account. The idea is maybe you go off for college and now you want your own Netflix and you're not gonna be on your parents' Netflix anymore. And so we had to come up with an icon to mean transfer my profile, which that doesn't exist. And we had to solve it. And so in the end, we did a little like, the little smiley face with this offset little smile that is like the classic Netflix profile image that kind of everyone starts with. It's basically that, but where the outline also turns into an arrow. So it literally looks like it's moving out of something. But it took us a while to land on that. So it's problems like that where you can't just solve it overnight. And if you want to use like a font awesome or a phosphor icons or something like that, they won't necessarily have an icon that means profile transfer because no one's ever thought of it before. And maybe they'd have something you could use in place of that, but they also don't have a person like me that you can talk to to solve that problem. Even if they theoretically had something in the library, you want to consult somebody whose expertise is around symbology. It's both solving the problem, but also having a person who's thoughtful and is going to help you solve it to create the I, asset. I'd like to double click on that because I've faced this issue before. When a symbol doesn't exist, how do you even start? What is your process for arriving at what ultimately became this profile transfer icon? So we started looking at, well, what is associated with profile transfer? What is associated with profiles? What's associated with transfers? I straight up just go on the noun project and start Googling or searching like transfer profile. I go onto the Netflix experience and I'm like, okay, what is this? Where is this in the UI? What's near it? And then we realized, oh, that little face guy, we had put him on the pictogram that we built for this, which is like a little suitcase. And I just put it on as like a little sticker because I thought it was cute. And the suitcase makes sense as a pictogram because it shows like, oh, you're taking something with you. But as an icon, a suitcase symbolizes other things. And for an icon, you need to be more iconic. Whereas with a pictogram, it can be a little bit more illustrative. So we have this pictogram. I'd put this little little smiley face guy on it because uh, for, for cuteness basically and to like add Netflixy flavor and then we kind of realized wait a minute that tiny detail in that illustration we made that's actually the part that we can take and then it's like how do we show movement arrows are very common and that kind of came about that way I think it's interesting because your process starts the same as mine I go to the noun project but <laughs> where you end up is a lot different than me <laughs> It's it, easier to scale up too. So like when I'm looking at creating a series of illustrations, like the profile transfer one, we have the pictogram, which is kind of in the middle, essentially, is a little suitcase with a little symbol on it to show like a person going off somewhere. At a smaller size, we take a smaller part of that. So instead of the suitcase, we took the little symbol. And then at a larger size, it's like, well, I can take everything I have in the pictogram. It could be a person holding a suitcase, like 
going off, or it could be a suitcase up in a cabin or flying through space or whatever. So starting smaller and going bigger is always going to be easier because you can just add detail. It's harder when someone's like, they send you a, a beautiful picture of a person traveling and are like, could we make an icon that has this vibe? And you're like, well, it's going to be hard because we got this much space <laughs> and you have a beautiful drawing that you would like to fit into this much space. Yeah, that, that, I've been that person, I think. Uh, <laughs> I know I've been that person. I'm also the designer that has like, yes, we need 24 pixels and 32 pixels. This is large. This is extra large. Yeah. So I'm like feeling conviction during this call. Uh, <laughs> so obviously you're at the top of your game and honestly at the pinnacle of this entire like industry, like very well respected mm -hmm. for someone like you, how do you ensure that you're not becoming stagnant and actually growing in your skill set? Great question. So I realized this. I was either, yeah, it was sometime last year. I was like, wait a minute. I'm one of the best icon designers in the world. Ooh, that's weird. I never expected to be the best at something. Like, who does that? Very few people. Um, so I, and I kind of realized it because I realized I was getting a little bored. I was like, I know how to do this. I know how to build a system. Most systems are not as complicated as the Netflix system. And I like developing new styles, but at a certain point I'm getting a little kind of tired. So there's kind of two things that I've done to help combat that and keep growing. One is I hired a subcontractor. I tried out a few people and I found the person who's the best fit for me right now. And so training him has been very fulfilling. His name is Griff. I work with Griff. Helping him go from a really good icon designer to being a really freaking awesome icon designer has been satisfying for me as a person who can help him then get his own freelance contracts. He'll work with me, but he also does his own thing. So teaching, very satisfying and mentoring. The other thing I'm doing is expanding my expertise. I try to only take projects at this point that are really well paid for companies that I am interested in and believe in at this point. I kind of just have enough inquiries that I can afford to do that. Um, the time where I will break that is if somebody asks me to do something I haven't done before that's interesting and will pay enough to kind of cover the time. And so the kinds of projects I'm taking right now that are in that category are emoji projects. I did some emojis for Contra. It was so incredibly fun. The ones I've been in for Netflix are super fun. So one came into my inbox recently and I'm actively working on it right now. And so even though the budget is a little bit lower than I would normally do, and I wasn't familiar with the company or the person asking me to do the work, I still was like, this is a project I should take because even though it's not the most time efficient, it's not the most money efficient, but it's going to teach me about how to make emojis. And I really enjoy making emojis. So that is a way that I'm kind of growing as a designer is by seeing how else I can infiltrate and then one day become one of the best emoji designers in the world. Another question that I have is for product design, a lot of times maybe you're being interviewed by a hiring manager or someone like that. Mm -hmm. And you're asked about your design principles and like what influences how you even think about design and what you ultimately create. And I'm wondering if you have something similar for iconography, these rooted beliefs or ways that you approach yes. icon systems. So um, success of a project for me, which I guess are my principles are efficiency. Am I creating efficiency for the team that I'm creating this for? Am I helping my subcontractor learn to be more efficient or am I learning to be more efficient? So either learning from my team or efficiency, like just straight up efficiency on the team I'm building something for, are they gonna have an easier time? Two is consistency. Um, I didn't even remember this is one of my principles when I was talking about it earlier, which now I'm laughing. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm kind of a consistent person. So am I creating consistency within the brand experience? Like, does this feel consistent with the other work that's in the product or in the brand? Am I helping create consistency across a product so that all designers are using the same asset, that sort of thing? And is the set within itself consistent? And then the last one I have is relief. So am I providing relief to the team who's going to be using what I'm building? Am I providing monetary relief to the subcontractor that I'm hiring? And am I going to be feeling relief and happiness when I finish this project? I would say efficiency, consistency, and relief. I love the fact that consistency 
keeps coming up. It's one of those things that feels very obvious to me, like as a designer, someone that would be ultimately using the icons you create, but it's a little bit of a black box to even think about how you as the, as the iconographer come in and, and even think about what consistency should mean. And one area that I'd love to drill into a little bit more is this idea of making sure that the icons you create are consistent with the brand guidelines that you're mm -hmm. inheriting. How do you figure out the overarching motifs and styles that would best work within the brand guidelines? There are maybe six different things that I would say I look at when I look at a brand to help me decide where is my inspiration coming from. A big one is photography or use of metaphor. How does the company position itself to the world when they're showing images of things or people? So an example of this is for the project I did with Spring Health. They are a mental health care company and they use a lot of floral photography and nature. So when I was creating icons for them, when it came to picking metaphors, we tried to use as many floral or nature metaphors as possible. So we needed an icon to represent death. This solved multiple problems, what we did. So you might think we could use a tombstone or a skull. <laughs> the issues with those are like, well, they're a little dark and this is a sensitive topic. What we ended up going with is a lily because lilies generally represent death as a concept in so many cultures. And you also typically give lilies as the kind of flower at a funeral. It uses the floral nature metaphor. It's pretty sensitive still, and it's universal. So that is kind of a way of taking their brand, looking at it, and then applying it to the metaphor that we're using. In that case, with that project, we also used like lots of very soft edges and kind of natural shapes and lots of curves, because again, it relates back to kind of all the flowers in nature. I also ended up using another thing, if you're not looking at photography, is logos. That's the easiest place to get inspiration from. Like the spring logo has a, a kind of like shape. That is super helpful. Love, love demo like that. It's basically a leaf. I'm trying to show you a leaf. And so wherever we could, instead of using a rectangle, I would use a leaf. And logos are really, really helpful to show you curves and level of sharpness and breaks and all these little things. You can look at the typography and see where to be inspired, which brings me to type. Type is another place. If they're using a really, really sharp typeface, you probably don't want to put some real curvy, organic looking icons with it. Similarly, if they have a very soft, very gentle typeface, very sharp icons are going to be a contrast because you are going to probably put a little icon in a button next to that type. It should look really good with the type. So type is, is another place. Other things I've looked at are like product experience, color palette sometimes if you're talking about larger icons or industry. So there could be chances where the industry itself is so weird or specific that you can find a way to use the actual industry to inspire yourself, but the others are easier. Let's transition a little bit to kind of just speaking to honestly, someone like myself who knows almost nothing about iconography, what advice would you give a designer who's looking to potentially explore what it would look like to grow in this area of iconography? If you have time, just starting with building a very small set that is completely unrelated to what you do in your day job. Because when you're learning a new skill and you're also trying to build something for work, the pressure of work can get in the way of the learning process sometimes. I used to teach, like I was a tutor when I was in college and I was tutoring people about design while I was studying design because I didn't have enough money to just study. What I learned doing that because I was teaching mostly Adobe, I was teaching Illustrator and Photoshop and InDesign as well as like basic design skills. Um, the students who were able to take the time to play around in the programs and learn how to build whatever it is they want to build, typically did then better actually creating projects using those programs than the students who were like, well, but I just have to finish this. So I want you to teach me while I'm doing the project because then it just kind of gets all mangled together. So kind of starting with, even if it's very small, something that's just fun, like I'm gonna make icons of different candies because I like candy, but something you like, make some icon set about that. It could be 10 icons, it doesn't have to be big. Um, the other thing I would say is you can get really far 
with a couple of basic skills or consistencies rather. So like, are all of your end caps the same? Are all, is all of your stroke weight the same? Are all of your frames the same size? Even if you just have that, it's gonna be so much better than most icon systems you're gonna find at a lot of companies because they are just built by different people who didn't have guidelines. Even if maybe individually each icon isn't bad, together they look like a hot mess because they don't go together. So if you're consistent with kind of those three things, it'll look like a pretty consistent icon set. Like it may not be super elaborate or unique, but it will look consistent and that will look good. So I would say that's another way to be like, okay, I just wanna make something that doesn't look terrible those are the things that you could like real quickly latch on to and start building and then kind of learn the rest as you go. This is a random question, but something that you just made me think of. Out of all of the icon libraries that are out there right now, mm -hmm. probably the free ones, do you ever look at them, spend time like studying them? Do you have any favorites or ones that you would highly recommend? Of course, I literally like every day, I'm like, how do I draw a phone again? And I, every time go look at the phosphor icon set, I'm like, hell no, how do I draw a phone? I can't draw a telephone, I don't want to. Um, so yeah, every time. Uh, I love phosphor. Helena's system is just, it's so beautiful. It's all free. Um, I really like that one. Um, I believe it's called Chunk or Chunky. I want to make sure I say it right. Mm, yeah, okay. So Chunk Icons. So Noah Jacobus designed these. It's a smaller library, but they are delightful. And because they're so chunky, they're really, really simple. So sometimes I will go there just to look at how the heck did he simplify something? They're also filled, which I typically make stroked icon sets because that's what people ask for most of the time. So if I need to look at a filled icon set, that's a fun one to look at and it's super unique. And then honestly, Font Awesome. There's a lot of people out there who'll be like, oh, Font Awesome, it's so basic. And I'm like, no, do you realize how much effort has gone into that? Like beyond the fact they have all these styles, um, like just the sheer number of icons and the searchability of them is amazing. So if I can be like, huh, I wonder what, you know, a turtle icon looks like because there's a bajillion ways to draw a turtle. I'll go on Font Awesome. And of course, Jory has drawn a turtle and it's great. Um, and that kind of gives me a starting point for, okay, my turtle has to be at least as good as Jory's turtle if I'm going to draw a turtle. I love that. It also makes me feel better that like even the best still kind of source inspiration from everything that everyone okay. else is doing. Like, I feel like a lot of people need to hear that. The further you get in the, your career, the more that some people I've heard talk about like feeling pressure to, to create from scratch and like it has to be my idea mm -hmm. and... Yeah. yeah, there's a reason that Font Awesome has been around for so long. It's really good. It's really, really, it's really good. good. Phosphor is really good. Like that's what we use at Maven. I love their Figma plugin. Yeah. So I was also encouraged to hear that you listed that one first because it, yeah. like, I feel validated in my own decision. One thing I've learned when I started designing thought, everything has to be unique. And then especially with icons, I've realized, no, it doesn't. <laughs> like... We want people to recognize these things. The whole point is that you're able to see it and know immediately what it is. So if you're reinventing the wheel over and over for something that you want people to recognize, it's probably not doing its job of being clear and recognizable. And so what I'll often start with is like how I draw a bus. Like if I'm gonna draw a bus, I like to draw a bus the same way every time. I like to draw the car kind of, a, I have a way of drawing a car that I like uh, for like a basic sedan. and. When I am starting a project, I'll do style exploration to show a client what their style could theoretically look like. And I know it's going to go beyond what I initially start with. But when I'm starting and I show them like three to five different styles, I'm not going to figure out what the fancy, crazy car thing is going to look like. I start with my basic sedan and apply the principles that I'm adding to the way that I draw a sedan. And then when they come back and say, oh, we wish it looked more serious or, oh, we don't actually want a sedan, we want an SUV because whatever reason, then I modify from there. Because typically that initial sedan gives them enough information looking at it in product screens to get a sense of what they're looking for. And then we can adjust from there. So I try not to spend too much time in the very beginning getting every single thing super unique because they may drop that icon. They might say, oh, actually, we saw the car. We thought we wanted a car, but we realized now we want a rabbit because we want to show speed and a rabbit is cuter and we are veterinarians. So, you know, whatever it is. Um, 
it's better to start a little rough and rely on your experience and then specialize and uniqueify things. Uniqueify, that's a word. It is now. As you go. It is now. Uniqueify. Hashtag. <laughs> <laughs> Can you shed a little bit of light on what your freelance process looks like and how you interface with clients and kind of how you guide them to the finish line? I have an assistant. Um, she helps with intake. So I have essentially a Google form that, or like a, a just a, a Google doc that has questions that she can send to any potential inquiries so that we can get information from a client before I have a video call with them because they might say, oh, we need 10 icons and we have $300. And I'm going to be like, well, that's not the project for me. Here is a list of some people maybe who would take that project. Um, so that is a starting point typically is her reaching out to them. Um, assuming that the project looks good, um, I typically will meet with somebody in a video call to honestly like kind of suss them out. Like what's their vibe? They seem like a good vibe because I can be picky at this point. And also even when you're starting out, you do not want a client who has red flags, who's maybe not going to pay you. Basically you, you want to get paid 100% <laughs> every time. So if I get into the call and they keep asking for discounts or if they're like, oh, can we pay you at the end of the pro? Mm. I want to make sure that they seem like a person who will pay me and also that they have a good idea of what they want because you can also waste a ton of time iterating and iterating and iterating when they don't know what they wanted in the first place. And if you're especially new to freelancing, you probably don't, if they don't know, you probably don't know yet because I've done projects where they didn't know. So I didn't, um, when I was starting out. So. I want to make sure they kind of know what they want, at least a sliver of, of an idea and that they're going to pay me because they seem upstanding, especially if I don't know them. From there, my personal process with, it could be icons, it could be a brand system as well, or illustrations is to create three options. It sounds like way too simple, but that is what so many freelancers do. I usually name them with musicians for some reason. I'll be like, style one, Rihanna. Style two, James Taylor. Style three, Taylor Swift. If it's called Taylor Swift, that's the best one. So I will show them three options. I'll kind of ask them to be like, you sure, sure, like 100%. We don't want to go back later. Um, have them give me any feedback. So that might be like, oh, we wish it was rounder or we like this style, but can you use square end caps instead? Or it needs to feel more fun. It could be, you know, it, it may not be as prescriptive. So then typically I'll take another pass at the style based on the one they like the best or sometimes combining two things into one, which happens a lot. I basically at that point just start building a library and we then go back and forth on rounds of how does this look, which ones are approved, and I'll slowly whittle away until they're all approved. At that point, I create a style guide and they put it in their design system. One more broad kind of advicey question. What's something that you know now that you wish you knew when you first started creating icons? I wish that I knew that I do not have to price myself hourly because pricing yourself hourly means you then also have to estimate how many hours it's going to be. And realistically, you can't know for sure. Sometimes it takes a lot less. Sometimes it takes a lot more. And so that can surprise your client. Or you can surprise yourself and then be like, oh, I'm not making as much money as I thought I was. So hourly, not as great as having either a per unit cost, which for me is easy per unit is per icon, or just a project fee, or you can split it up into like, the style guide is this much, and my exploration is this much, and the email system is this much, and the logo is, you know, you can, depending on what kind of project it is, you can split it up into deliverables that have costs. And that, in my experience, clients really like because they then know the project costs thirty thousand dollars. They're going to give you thirty thousand dollars, and they're going to get what they asked for. And you know, you get thirty thousand dollars. So that has worked much better for me. Also, because, and you don't realize this until you're really good at your job, you get faster. So of course, you raise your hourly rate, but you just get faster. So you're doing fewer hours, but you're better at your job and you're doing it faster for them. So you're providing more value in less time, but then getting paid less because at a certain point you can't ask for more than a certain amount per hour or people just will not like talk to you. They care about the thing they're getting at the end of the day. So as much as you can charge 
based on a project fee or deliverables based fee because over time you're going to get better at your job and you're going to get faster and it's going to be a disservice to yourself to charge per hour. I love that. I, I think That's charging probably, hourly is just, it, it misaligns incentives totally. So like something yeah, that I switched to is not doing hourly, but maybe I don't feel confident enough to give like a full project rate, especially for something like designing mm -hmm. a mobile app where that can mm -hmm. scope creep is real. But what yeah. you can do is align on weekly objectives. This is the deliverable for yeah. this week and I have a fixed rate and that way they can opt out at any point and they know what they're getting yeah. each week. And then I'm incentivized to work really efficiently because I can directly impact my hourly rate. And I think it makes a lot of sense. And too many yeah. people, especially when they're starting off, think that they have to do this hourly rate. Yeah. I've also seen projects this way where I will say, well, you can have me on retainer for a week, a month. I will work as much as you ask of me this month. Because again, I know I am very good at my job. It's not going to take me 40 hours a week. I'm because I'm good at my job. I'm not going to overload myself anyway, but uh, I can say, okay, you can have me for a month. This is how much it costs for a month. So it might be like, okay, for a month, you can hire me for $25,000 and I'm at your beck and call whenever you need, or here's everything broken down by deliverable and it's going to cost $23,000 and it takes as long as you want, but you and I don't worry about when I'm available. I just do the work for you and get it done. And it might take six weeks. It might take three weeks. And so you can charge a like weekly or monthly fee, which can work. And especially as you're describing with product design, something that could take a really long time. You might also want to do that because if the project is really big, like if it's a hundred thousand dollars, you don't necessarily want to get paid 50% up front and then be waiting on that other 50,000 for like a year. That could be really rough as a like, you know, person who has to eat food and live in a house. Um, so, uh, having milestones is another really good way of setting things up for those really big projects. And a lot of companies are fine with milestone based pricing. Yeah. It makes total sense. So I noticed in the beginning of your journey, you said you were using Adobe and I know now that you're using Figma for all of your icons. So when did that switch happen and what makes Figma your preferred tool? I remember it well back in 2017, um, back in olden times, pre-pandemic. I was working at Square and Dustin Tanner joined the company. I did not know who this dude was, but he ended up in a meeting with me and he was talking about design systems, which I had never heard of. And he was talking about Figma, which I had never heard of. And I was like, this is like year two of my like tech career. So like I'd done other stuff, but this is... I was a baby when it comes to like the tech industry. And he was like, oh, you're make the one making all the icons. I know you're making them all in Illustrator. We would like to have them in Figma because we're going to potentially use Figma as our design system. And I was using Sketch for email design. I was putting illustrations into Sketch just to lay out in emails. I wasn't using Sketch for drawing. And I was like, well, Illustrator though, like I've been using Illustrator since I was uh, 16. So quite a while. What are you talking about this Figma stuff? And Figma was not a big deal. It was like 2017. No, nobody really knew what it was. So I agreed, well, I could put the Illustrator drawings into Figma. And then he was like, okay, well, you're making some product icons too. Maybe just try making them in Figma. I like, oh, okay, I'll try it. Because I was young enough that I was willing to still try new things. And so I started building some product icons in it and went, oh no. Why did I just build everything in Illustrator over the past year? This is amazing. This is so much easier because at that point they did have the live Boolean operations. And that for me was like done. Everything else could be worse and it would be worth it for that because that is as a production person who's thinking about shipping and thinking about engineers and people like that, having things be live is incredible. <laughs> And then I kind of got involved with the folks at Figma because Dustin was like, come to the Figma office. It's down the street. And I met some people who work there and realized that they are a company who cares so much about designers and who care about individual people like me, a single human being. Um, and so the tool was great. The people who worked there listened. They actually wanted me to tell them what I thought about the thing they were building. Um, and 
it just started to make more and more sense because as I got closer to product, I realized one, I can make more money because people in product get paid more than people in brand, which I'm not saying is right. I'm just saying that's how it is. And I want to buy things like food. So you make more money, the closer you are to product. If you use the same tools as the people in product, then you're going to be closer to them. And the natural progression is that then you're also closer to engineering. Cause if you're an engineer, you get paid more than if you're in product. Basically, I wish I could be an icon engineer. That is how you would make the most money possible. So I realized, okay, I want to be in cahoots with these product designers because that's how I'm going to get my stuff implemented. Because one of the issues we were having at Square was the brand team made stuff and product isn't doing anything with it. Well, we're not in the same tools. We don't have a connection to them. So everything aligned. And then Figma just was the freaking rocket ship. They just started adding features like being able to put things in a grid and organize it in a grid and plugins and um, select, uh, selection colors and all this stuff where it was like everything I ever could have wanted is there and it's fast and it doesn't crash and it was essentially free to use. And if you're at a company, it's free. And I was like, it's everything. It's doing everything I could ever want. And hilariously now they are part of Adobe, but I think that that is seriously for everyone's benefit in the end, because we also have to be able to work with animators and After Effects ain't going anywhere, I don't think. So like being able to be part of one ecosystem, I think is a benefit. I do think Figma being part of Adobe, it's going to be okay. And I still love them as a company and I know some of the cool stuff they're working on and it's very cool. And I'm just like, okay, this is it. Like. This is amazing. It's interesting. I mean, I teach a Figma course now, and I wasn't even using Figma in 2017. So you were in very early. Like, that's super early. Okay, I want to double click on one more thing because you said something very interesting, which is talking about how your ability to collaborate effectively with engineering directly Mm. contributes to how valuable you are as an icon designer. So I'm wondering what that collaboration looks like and what are some of the ways that you intentionally set engineers up for success? Some of it is practical. Like I have learned to read enough of SVG code for a black and white icon or, you know, black transparent background, like enough of an icon that I can tell when things are wrong with it before I give it to an engineer. And so things like that stop the engineer from having to go, it's broken. And then me going into Figma, realizing it's not Figma, it's just the SVG. And honestly, like the engineers I'm working with are extremely talented, busy people. So I don't want them having to open up individual SVGs. That is not a good use of their time. So things like that, I learned to use just just enough of Android Studio that I can look at, in this case, it's illustrations, because that could be a pictogram that's pretty small or an app icon or thing that needs to go into Android, basically. And... The way that XML files work is complicated, apparently, and also not complicated in that they are very restrictive. And I have spent time learning what they can and cannot do because an engineer just says it's broken. It's something with the gradients. They don't know enough about different types of gradients because that's not their job. Whereas I can go in and go, that's the gradient that's breaking. Test, 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 test. Okay, what I've established is actually here's the restriction. There isn't a great explanation on the internet for why this isn't working because the people using Android Studio are not illustrators and engineers are not illustrators and illustrators don't touch code. So in this case, I've learned enough about it to be able to problem solve before I even give something to an engineer. So the engineer is like, rad, I'll just implement this. So being able to kind of use their tools and live in their world, very, very helpful. And then also it's things like, thinking about the system from a perspective of the person who's receiving files. So this is like the production designer mindset. How am I naming things? Because if you name things in a kind of crappy way, yeah, it's going to impact designers because they will have to use your assets, but it's even more annoying for engineers because it goes into their code base. And I assume code base is the right term. This is where my knowledge starts to get fuzzy. I'm sure that they would be okay with it. I called something very engineering-y the other day and an engineer laughed. So hopefully it was not in despair. So like things like naming, how am I going to make this easier for engineers? Is there a way we could categorize things so that when it goes into the code, it's easy to find things because one day they're going to want to change all of them and you want it to be the same everywhere and you want it to be easy to know what it is. So it's consistency in naming and then also like being smart about how you name things. Like we don't want to call something 
idea, you'd call it light bulb because idea is kind of generic, whereas light bulb is definitely going to be a light bulb and just getting to know them. They are also humans realizing that they are people who also like want to have a good time and like chit chat. And so building those relationships is also important because one day you might want to refer them to something or they may refer you to Airbnb, even though they don't really know what you do. They know it's drawing something. And that's how you get a job at Airbnb. (laughs) 